Welcome to the solutions video for the aspirations from lesson one of category theory, the beginner's introduction. These solutions will allow us to discuss some important foundational aspects of category theory, so let's get started. Aspiration one part A asks, consider the following arrangement of objects. How many ways can you arrange two arrows among these objects, one between A and B and another between B and C, to form a partial triangle? Number your diagrams and name the arrows F and G. Well, there are two arrows and two directions for each arrow, so there are two times two equals four ways you can arrange two arrows between three objects, with one arrow between A and B and the other between B and C. And here they are. I just named the arrow on the left F and the one on the right G in all cases. Now part B asks, complete all those partial triangles that theory tells you you can complete. Give the name of the arrow you have drawn, and every construct in lesson two will be based on one of the diagrams you could not automatically complete. So remember in video two, when we discussed composition, we said that given two arbitrary arrows, A to B1 and B2 to C, we can form the composite G following F from A to C, if and only if B1 equals B2. That is, whenever we have a path of two consecutive arrows. Well, in diagram one, we have such a path we can get from A to B and from B to C, so we can get from A to C. And the name of this arrow should be G following F, which means apply F, then apply G. In diagram two, we also have a path C to B and from B to A, so we can form the composite from C to A, and in this case, it should be named F following G. In diagram three and four, however, you cannot automatically add an arrow A to C or C to A in either case. There are special cases when you can, understanding those cases and what information or structure such an arrow will produce, will be our goal for the rest of our exploration of category theory. Do these two diagrams remind you of anything? Remember in video five when we discussed the components of a cluster map versus a splitting map? Our first non-degenerate cluster or splitting was a two cluster or two splitting. The two cluster corresponds to diagram three and the two splitting to diagram four. I remember when I said in video two, notice how we're using the term arrow to describe the arrows in set. This will become important later. Well, now I can explain a little bit more about that statement. Category theory is really about describing an abstract structure and then showing how that abstraction can be applied to different kinds of objects and arrows. We can say A and C are elements of a domain of a set D, for example, and B is a set E, which in this case would be isomorphic to the terminal object. So diagram three will therefore be a mapping graph of an internal diagram of a map in a category. Category of abstract sets and arbitrary mappings, to be specific. If, however, we consider A, B, and C to be objects in some category, and F and G to be arrows of some sort, then we get a diagram of objects in a category. And we've already seen how we can vary the objects. They could be sets, graphs, or groups of some types, a set of organisms representing a biological family, with two special maps showing the relations between them, and it really doesn't matter. The insights you gain from studying these diagrams can be applied to any datum as long as you have an identity arrow, and your concept of an arrow, whatever that may be, satisfy the three simple rules of composition, associativity, and the identity laws. But we can take this abstraction a level higher. We can consider A, B, and C to be categories that would make F and G functors. Or higher still, with A, B, and C as functors and F and G as natural transformations. This is the reason why, in most introductions to category theory, all these concepts are discussed at once because they're not different concepts, they're just the same concept applied to different classes of objects and arrows. And this is also precisely why I decided to discuss them separately, because since they are the same concept, if you understand them really well applied to a certain class of objects and arrows, then you can easily transfer that knowledge to another class of objects and arrows. I wanted to mention this now because I don't want you to think, oh, this is just a really basic stuff in the beginning. I can skim through it, but once we get to the more complicated concepts, then that's when I'll pay full attention. No. In general, concepts don't get more complicated in a category theory. They are just applied to more structured objects and arrows and encapsulate more information. And then they're given different names, which confuses the hell out of beginners. All there is a category theory are objects and arrows. So as we progress through discussing S, please pay close attention to every concept about the relationships between objects and arrows that we discuss, because we will make use of all these concepts in the future 
in exploring different categories and in exploring functors between categories and in exploring natural transformation between functors, etc. So by the time we get to discussing functors, we can spend just one lesson on them because it'll mostly be a lot of remember when we discussed this concept X in sets or in graphs or in dynamical system? Well, this is the same idea. Either approach to learning or teaching category theory is valid. The approach of teaching everything at once is particularly useful if you're interested in a more abstract route to category theory. This approach is better, I think, if you're actually interested in applying category theory to solving real problems. And plus, it's easier for both you and me, because by the time we get to discussing these concepts, I would have already have made visualizations of objects in many categories. So in describing a functor, I can actually create visualizations of that functor for you. If I had started describing them now, we couldn't visualize them. So I mentioned that diagrams 3 and 4 form the basis of everything that we will study in category theory. Let me illustrate this by showing you the concepts that we will study in lesson 2 and 3 and which diagrams they're based on. So first, the concepts that are based on diagram 3. The first one is the choice or lifting problem, and it asks, given arrows F and H of a common codomain, can we find a G such that the diagram commutes? This section is a special case of this. Here, given a map F from A to B, we want to map S from B to A such that F following S is equals to the identity on B. The code product has this structure as well, but without any arrows between the bottom pair. And monics and co-equalizers both have the same abstract structure, although their definitions say quite different things. And these are the concepts based on diagram four. The determination problem, on which the next exploration is based, asks, given an F and an H, can you find a G such that a diagram commutes? A retraction is a special case of this, for which R following F is equal to the identity on the domain. The product has this structure without the third map. And finally, both epics and equalizers have this abstract structure. And just as an interesting note, pullbacks and pushouts have both diagram three and diagram four embedded in them in different corners of the square of four elements. We will look at those in the next lesson as well. But now let's look at the solution of the second exploration. This next exploration, as successfully completed, would have introduced you to many interesting and useful concepts, determination problems, performing algebra on functions, involutions, idempotence, dynamical systems, and permutations. It began as rather basic. The answer to part A is of course 4, 2 to the power of 2. Part B is equally as trivial. We said we would be using the convention of numbering the points of a set X starting at 0, so the four maps are as follows. I thought those numbers for the alphas made the most sense but it doesn't matter how you number them. Okay, so you wouldn't know this unless you have experience with these things, but alpha zero and alpha one are dynamical systems and alpha two is a permutation, which is a dynamical system consisting solely of cycles, i.e. no branches. Part C asks for the mapping graphs, which are very important. It's the easiest way to form intuition about concepts and set. Plus, by drawing the graph, it will make the answers to the following parts more obvious. Here they are. Now we start to ease into the more interesting parts. D asks you to recall two things. One, that a commutative diagram means that all paths between two objects must be interpreted as the same arrow, which will allow you to write down the relation G following one A is equals to F. Then two, that the identity law requires that G following one A equals G, which will allow you to conclude that G equals F, which is all the proof you need. In part E, you are given two specific maps, F0 and F1, and asked to draw the mapping graphs, the structure of which should remind you of the two endomorphisms you drew earlier. And finally, in part F, we have arrived at a determination problem. The question asks, consider all maps alpha i from A to A. For each alpha i, can you find a map G not equals to F0 such that the following diagram commutes? And for each alpha i, if you can't, explain why not. If you can, draw the mapping graph of all such G. Describes the relationship between F0 and all the maps G you found. We can say that each G has been transformed into F0 through the action of alpha i. What name will you give to this action? An example, alpha i is the blank map. Okay, so how do we approach this? Well, first let's write down the equation that G must satisfy. G following alpha i is equals to F0. Well, we see that F0 of A0 is equal to B0, and F0 of A1 is equals to B1. So we can write the following relations with the unknown image of alpha i as a question mark. 
So the image of G must be the same as F. And these relations also put an important restriction on alpha i, namely the following restriction. If alpha i of aj is equals to alpha i of ak, then aj must equals to ak. Which is just a positive way of saying, and remember we must always be positive in category theory, that alpha i cannot take two points of a to the same point of a, because then there will be no valid g that would make the diagram commute. So neither alpha 0 nor alpha 1 would work. Let's take alpha 0 for example, which sends both points of a into a0. The relations then become g following alpha 0 of a0 is equal to g of a0, which is equal to b0, and g following alpha 0 of a1 is equal to g of a0, which is equal to b1. In other words, such a g following this endomap is required to split a 2 cluster into two 1 clusters, which is impossible in this. Remember we said that the cluster size can increase or remain unchanged via composition but can never decrease? This is why. To decrease any n cluster, where n is greater than or equal to 2, would involve sending one element of the domain to two different elements of the co-domain. So we can rule out both alpha 0 and alpha 1 from consideration. Can alpha 2 work? Well, if we plug it into our equation, here's what we get. g following alpha 2 of a0 is equal to g of a1, which is equal to b0. And g following alpha 2 of a1 is equal to g of a0, which is equal to b1. Which is a valid map a to b, and the only one that would work. The equation pretty much determines this, since the image of f is the size of a, then only one g could be the solution, because f puts a restriction on both assignments of g. Let's look at the mapping graphs to get a picture of this. So here are alpha 2 and g on the left and f0 on the right. g following alpha 2 is equal to f0. If you follow the arrows from a0 to a1 to b0 and from a1 to a0 to b1, you will see that. As to what name we shall give this map, well to make g into f, all we need to do is swap, switch, exchange, interchange its assignments. I like swap map. Alpha 2 is a permutation of 2 cycle. These will become useful to us in the future for this very reason. Taking an abstract structure, two connections in this case, and showing how one concretization of that structure can be transformed into another. Part G asks for the same thing, but with F1. Let's follow the same procedures last time. First we note that we need G fallen alpha I to equals to F1. Well, we see that F1 of A0 is equals to F1 of A1, which is equals to B0. So we can write the following relations with the question marks as we did before. First note that f g equals f, then this places absolutely no restriction on alpha i. It can do whatever it wants. f following any endomorphism of a would still equal f. f is what we call a constant map. It factors through 1. Since 1 is a terminal object, then there's only one map to 1 from any set a. So to say that this diagram commutes is precisely to say that there's some point of b that f takes all the points of a too. f is determined by that point of b through the action of the unique map to the terminal object. So back to this problem. We can't have g equals f, so let's go through each alpha and see what our mystery relation becomes. First with alpha 0. g following alpha 0 of a0 is equals to g of a0 which is equals to b0. And g following alpha 0 of a1 is equals to g of a0 which is equals to b0. So we see that alpha 0 has only restricted g's assignment for one point of a, which means that we can send the other point anywhere in b we like. Well, except b0 because then g would equal f. So we have two choices, and thus there are two g's that satisfy this relation. g0 of a0 is equals to b0, g0 of a1 is equals to b1, and g1 of a0 is equals to b0, and g1 of a1 is equals to b2. A similar analysis on alpha 1 will yield two g's that satisfy its relation. g2 of a0 is equals to b1, and g2 of a1 is equals to b0. And g3 of a0 is equals to b1, and g3 of a1 is equals to b0. Alpha 2 has no solutions that are not f itself, because if you swap any two members of a cluster with two or more members, you get the same image, right? You can only swap between clusters to create new maps. Oh, and by the way, you can name A0 and A1 combinators or two clustering maps because any map following them will mirror their structure. Do you notice the relationship between G0 and G2 and between G1 and G3? 
G2 is a swap of G0 and G3 is a swap of G1. Then we can make a guess in part H and say that alpha 2 following alpha 0 is equals to alpha 1 and alpha 2 following alpha 1 is equals to alpha 0. Because remember we said that G following F is the same as G of F. So swap of alpha 0 will become swap following alpha 0 and swap of alpha 1 will become swap following alpha 1. So AJ is equals to alpha 2, AI alpha 0, and AK alpha 1. To get the diagram with alpha 0 from the existing diagram, we have two options. We could swap these two arrows, or we could swap the direction of the swap map. In fact, since alpha 2 is an isomorphism, we don't need to do either. Its inverse is of course itself, so we can represent both these maps by one diagram. Let's skip and do J to see that. Here are the relations the question asks for. Alpha 0 following alpha 0 is equal to alpha 0. Alpha 1 following alpha 1 is equal to alpha 1. And alpha 2 following alpha 2 is equal to 1a, which makes alpha 0 and alpha 1 idempotent, and alpha 2 an involution. The definition of these terms mean exactly what the relation says. An idempotent is an endomorphism f such that f following f is equal to f. And an involution is an endomorphism f for which f following f is equals to 1a. In other words, f is its own inverse. So involutions are necessarily isomorphisms. And isomorphisms, by the way, are one of the topics of lesson 2. And here are additional relations that should be obvious. They say that for alpha 0 and alpha 1, it doesn't matter which endomorphism is composed with it on the right, the result of that composition will always be equal to alpha 0 or alpha 1, respectively. And this is what it means to be a constant map. So now part i should be obvious. We are looking for a fixed choice of alpha i and alpha j so that we can vary fk, and for each unique choice of fk, there will be unique g's and unique h's such that the diagram commutes, and all the solutions for all the choices of fk describe all the maps a to b. So we know immediately that alpha j can't be either alpha 0 or alpha 1, because we can't compose anything of either of these maps on the right to yield a new map. So alpha j must be alpha 2. Then alpha i can be either alpha 0 or alpha 1. It doesn't matter which we choose. Remember, because 1 is determined by the other composed with alpha 2. I'm going to choose alpha 0. If we make our first choice for fk, f1 seems the obvious choice, we see that we get five maps. For each of the two g's that make the diagram commute, there's a corresponding h given by the swap map. So we need three such diagrams. The three FKs are the three two clusters A to B, one in each element of B. The first one gives us five new maps, the second three, the third one. But if we fix FK to F1, then add an endomorphism on B, specifically a permutation, a three cycle beta, where beta B0 is equals to B1, beta B1 is equals to B2, and beta b2 is equals to b0. Then we can describe all the maps a to b with this single commutative diagram. To understand why, let's take a closer look at beta. Beta b0 is equals to b1, and beta b1 is equals to b2. So we can substitute the values for b1 in the second equation to yield beta of beta of b0 is equals to b2. And we can substitute that into the third relation to yield beta of beta of beta of b0 is equals to b0. So it's a permutation because all elements in b are in its image, and there are only connections. And if you apply beta to an element three times, you get back where you started. We can rewrite each assignment relation with a superscript on beta corresponding to the number of times it is applied. And to describe our observations on the nature of beta, we can say that beta of b0 is equals to beta 4 b0, which is equals to b1. And to generalize this, we note that beta of b is equals to beta 4 of b for arbitrary b in b. To see that this is a three cycle, we just subtract the superscript on the left from the one on the right. We will see lots more of these objects in the future when we explore the category of permutations, but why does this produce all the maps a to b? Well, notice that each application of beta will keep the structure of the diagram intact just interchange its elements. It will be the same as varying the fk's in a cycle.
You can verify this yourself, but let's look at one example. Let's apply beta once to F1 and its two solutions G0 and G1. We see we get three new maps, but maps that would satisfy the leftmost triangle in the diagram. This is a simple but effective means of varying the structure involving maps of a common codomain that I will use very often. Let's say for example that this diagram represents an operation of some sort that we want to apply to data. It involves five maps each and there are three possible combinations of these five maps that are of interest to us. We could conditionally specify a collection solely by giving a number between one and four, where one means apply beta once and four means don't apply beta. But we can't say that. Remember, it must be positive, so apply beta four times. Or these maps could represent observations on data that represent a structure of some sort that is of interest. Then each observation will correspond to a number between one and four. And a sequence of such observations will correspond to an ordered set of numbers between one and four. For example, one, one, three, four, three, three, one. We can then compare sequences of observations by comparing maps from each sequence set SI into a set X of size four. And each A can be a different set we can have as many as we like, and the size of B and the endomorphisms of B will determine exactly how they can be varied. And we don't always have to choose a cycle, right? We could choose any dynamical system. And notice that we can keep structuring this in the same way. If we have a commutative diagram of sequences that represents some higher order structure, then we can equip the set X of size 4 with an endomorphism that shows how this collection of sequences of related observations can be varied. I hope Aspiration 2 gave you more of an idea of how powerful category theory really is, and also provided some justification for why we'll be exploring so many categories and concepts. These things just arise naturally while working in category theory. Let's say, for example, that we wanted to choose another endomorphism of B in this diagram. How can we systematically compare our choices? We could do that in set, but it's best to do so in a category in which these objects live. I also hope by now that you are very comfortable with thinking with map relations and with diagrams. The last three explorations will test this. Exploration 3 asks to use a terminal object to form a definition for the equality of maps in S between an arbitrary A, B, F, and G in the category, i.e. to complete the following definition template. In S, for arbitrary sets A and B, with maps F from A to B and G from A to B, we say that F equals G if and only if blank. Well, if we go back to that commutative diagram from exploration 2 part D, we see that we concluded from this diagram that G equals F. So how do we form a general definition from this? Well, let's consider an arbitrary point one of A. For an arbitrary point, this diagram must commute. Actually, that's the definition. Well, let's write the relations and say that if g following 1a of following a is equal to f following a for all points, then g is equal to f. Using associativity and the identity laws, we can conclude that if g following a is equal to f following a for all points, then g is equal to f. And since composition is evaluation in S, then this becomes if g of a is equal to f of a for all points, then g is equal to f. So to form this into a definition, we can simply say, in S, for arbitrary sets A and B, with maps F from A to B and G from A to B, we can say that F equals G if and only if they agree on points. That is, F the following diagram commutes for all unique maps A, 1 to A. Aspiration 4 says, use the terminal object in S and your knowledge of cluster types in an arbitrary map F from A to B to describe the abstract structure of any F that satisfies the following conditions with maps G1 from C to A and G2 from C to A. If F following G1 is equal to F following G2, then G1 is equal to G2. The first thing we want to do, the first thing we should always do, is draw an external diagram of the object under consideration in the problem. Here, I could have drawn 1C with two arrows into A. It's the same diagram. Now let's use 1 to choose an arbitrary point of C. Well, G1 following C must equal some point of A, and G2 following C must equal some point of A. Notice that if G1 following C is equal to G2 following C is equal to A0, for example, then F following G1 following C must equal to F following G2 following C, because 
f being a valid map in the category has to take a0 to a unique point of b. So the converse of this condition is obviously always true. Let's assume that g1 following c is not equal to g2 following c and see how we can make the composites with f equal. So let's say g1 following c is equal to a0 and g2 following c is equal to a1. So for the composites to be equal, we need that f of a0 equals f of a1 equals some b in b. Let's say b0. From that relation, you can tell it's a two cluster. So if f is to satisfy that condition, it can't have any two clusters. But notice that it can't have any three clusters or any n cluster where n is greater than or equal to two. In other words, it cannot combine unique points of a because then we could get a situation as we just saw where f following g1 is equals to f following g2, but g1 is not equals to g2. So f must consist solely of zero clusters and one clusters. It must be defined on each element of a, so that means it must connect each element of a with a unique element of b. So b must be at least as big as a, i.e. such an f requires that the size of b be greater than or equal to the size of a. Notice that choosing an arbitrary point of C is equivalent to imagining that C is 1, so we can redraw the diagram with two maps 1 to A. This is a definition of a monomorphism, another topic of lesson 2, and this definition is valid in any category. In S, these are the injective mappings. You can think of it as if A is injecting its points into B. This concept will be a guide in many categories. In the categories of sets of a permutation, the monoarrows inject whole permutations. The monomorphisms in dynamical systems inject whole dynamical systems. I.e., the image of a monet map is a valid object in these categories. This is why when we define sub-objects, we will do so using monomorphisms. In applying category theory to data analysis, most of what I've been able to achieve has been because of monomorphisms. Remember when we briefly looked at exponentials and said that the property of exponentials correspond to the properties of maps between sets? Well, by choosing a suitable injection into the natural numbers, the properties of these numbers will correspond to properties of the object under consideration. In other words, these monomorphisms in S connect category theory to number theory. Perhaps not surprising since they consist solely of connections. Exploration 5 politely requests that you draw a diagram from Exploration 4. Unless you already knew this stuff, you should have done that anyhow, but just in case you didn't. Okay, so it tells you, imagine that this is a diagram in SOP, the opposite category, and to describe the nature of any F that satisfies the same condition. Then describe what the H that corresponds to this F in S must be like, and write down the conditions it must satisfy. Well, this is easy, right? You can just cheat, ignore what I said, and just use the duality principle to form a new definition. Reverse all the arrows and reverse the order of the composites, and you get that H must satisfy if G1 following H is equal to G2 following H, then G1 is equal to G2. Then you can stay in S and explain the nature of that H. But I actually think it's easier to understand this definition in SOP. So let's do what the problem says and explore the nature of such an F in SOP. Okay. So in SOP, let's do this via mapping graphs. What choice should we make for C? We can't choose a one element set because remember, this is the initial object in SOP. So there's only one map from it to every other set X because it has to split into all of X. So whereas one is your best friend in S, two is your best friend in SOP. Let's also make A two and B three for variety. Now let's fix F to make A one split into all of B. And now let's find two maps. C to A, G1 and G2, where G1 is not equals to G2, but F following G1 is equals to F following G2. So let's choose just G1 and G2. Now the first part of the condition is true, but the last part false, because F following G1 is equals to F following G2. Why? Well remember, maps in SOP need to split into all of the codomain. So if any map following the splitting map has an element that chooses to do nothing, then this potentially results in a composite losing some of the information that the maps it is comprised of contain. So now, let's find an F that preserves this information. Now you can see that there's no way that G1 and G2 can be different but their composites be equal. So back to monet maps and S, we can view that condition to mean that by preserving uniqueness we preserve all the pieces of information we had, i.e. the number of elements. In SOP, the information is the nature of the splittings. We need to preserve that. 
and this can only be done if every element at least connects. It can end split where n is greater than 0, but it must at least connect. So this tells us a map A to B in S op that satisfies this condition means that the size of B is greater than or equal to the size of A, because every element of A needs to at least connect. So now that we understand this, we can reverse the arrows, both the arrows in the external diagram and the arrows in the mapping graph, and go into S, and we have a new definition. Notice what this type of map, which is an epimorphism, has become in S. Since the domain becomes a codomain, it means that every element of A, the codomain of H, must be an image of at least one element of B, the domain. These are precisely the surjective mappings in S. But, just like the definition of monomorphism, this definition applies to any category. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed this first exploration set. It should have nicely prepared you for lesson two, and I'll see you then.